So, I'm going to be reading chapter 17, 18, and 19 of, of Stamped. The original uploads of these, well, I don't know what happened to them, but they're gone. So, I might as well try to do it again, but shove into one. Chapter 17. Birth of a New Nation and a New Nuisance. The same year the first Tarzan novel was published, black people got tricked again by a political candidate. They helped to get the Democrat Willie Woodrow Wilson elected. Now it seems like a good time to address the whole Republican Democrat thing. At this point in history, the Democrats dominated the South. They were opposed to the expansion of civil rights and anything that had to do with far-reaching federal power, like railroads in the West and with us of homesteaders and not slave owners, owners, and even state university systems. Today we say they were against big government. Republicans at the dime dominated the North. They work for civil rights, at least politically, and want an expansion in railroads, and even a state university system. I know. I feel like I got my descriptions mixed up. But we're living in backward land. We are. Anyway, back to Woodrow Wilson. He was a Democrat, and during his first term, he let black people know what he thought about them by enjoying the first of her film screening in the White House. The first of Hollywood's first blockbuster film, D.W. Griffin's The Birth of Nation. The film was based on a book called The Klansman. Can you guess how what the movie was about? A black man, played by a white woman, played by a white man, a black person, no, a black person, played by a white man in blackface, tries to rape a white woman. She jumps off a cliff and kills herself. Cl and men avenge her death, and that's it. The beginning of beginning of a new outrage. Rape. I want to be clear here. This. Rape, in general, isn't meant to be taken lightly, or to be turned back on the victim as a sharp blade of blame. But during this time, allegations of rape were often used as an excuse to lynch black men rooted to the stereotype of the savagery of the black man and the preciousness of the white woman. Black men protested the movie. The intel Lex, Lex like Booker T., Washington and Webb Du Bois fought in their intellectual ways, writing, but Southern Blacks did much more. They protested with their feet. It was time to go. It's important to note that this was during the Great War, also known as World War I. But the Great War at home between Blacks and Whites had pushed Blacks to the brink. Black people started to leave the South in droves. Imagine the biggest parade you've ever seen, but then multiply it by a bazillion but it doesn't look as uniform as happy. This was a parade of progress, one of hope after severe exhaustion. Black people were tired of being lied to, tired of being told life was better after emancipation, as if Jim Crow laws hadn't made their lives miserable, as if politicians had taken advantage of them, milking them for both to gain power, only to slap them back down. As if the media hadn't continued you to push racist narratives that would put black lives risk at black lives or black people's lives at risk off page and off screen. Chapter eighteen Black people from the South were headed to Chicago, to Detroit, to New York. Some even came from the Caribbean to escape colonialism. A Jamaican man, Marcus Gavery, was one of them. And the first thing that he he did 
raise enough money for a school in Jamaica, and the first thing he did once he arrived to New York in 1916 was visit the NICPA office. The NICP was started by two men who had been writing books about the anti-slavery activist John Brown. In 1859, Brown, a white man, raided the United States States in Harper Ferry's West Virginia with the intention of arming slaves and starting a revolution. He was caught and, of course, executed. Du Brown wrote Br Du Bois wrote Brown's biography in the year was published, 1909. It was also a year named of a man named Oswald Garrison Villard published his biography of the same person. Villard was white and happened to be William Lloyd Garrison's grandson. Who do you think sold more books? But instead of Du Bois cutting Villard down, um, like he did with Booker T. Washington. He began to work with Villard to form the National Association for the Advancement of Colonized People. Their mission was in the name. And when Marcus Gary showed up, he was expecting that mission to be shown on the actual people working for the organization. Glavery was looking for Du Bois. But when he got to the office, he was confused whether about the NAACP was a black organization or white one. And that was simply because no one dark-skinned worked there. It was as if the only black people who could succeed in America were brackle and skin-toned. Such as if the talent tenth were the only black people of value. Such a list way of thinking. An anti-racist like Avery saw all black people as valuable. saw blackness as valuable in culture and in color. So Gary decided to set up shop in Harlem and start his own organization. His own organization called the Universal Negro Import Improvement Association UNIA. Its purpose was to focus on African solidarity. The beauty of dark skinned and of African skinned culture. And global African uh, self determination. He basically created the exact opposite of the talented tenth. Avery wasn't the only one who noticed in the typical Americans. Ingenious people who believe you can control the quantity and the quality of human beings by keeping undesired. Genetics out, meaning the mix of black people were criticizing and burning the mixing of races because whiteness was seen as pure. There were new versions of racial hexterity, which meant which weren't that new because black people were already were, they were already where was that again? Still, all right, still existed at the bottom, but the argument wasn't the more white blood people had, the better they be. And tactically, listen, I could give the more of their lines, but I would have said this a million times right now. They were arguing what they have been arguing, that black were born to be less than a mixing with whites, keep leg up, and that not because they weren't all the way black, and black and black that would tie up the Christian IQ test and standardized test all skewed by the dumb black and the ones that must have in them yada 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 yet in the midst of the great war black men were good enough to fight smart enough to be tactical motivated enough to run roll shoot and save of course Du Bois went over to Paris after the war ended to document the stories of black soldiers for for the, the crisis, the newspaper he started. The stories he was told, and that he documented, were ones of black heroes. When the white officers came to the States to tell their version of the stories, the black heroes had become black nothings. More important, black soldiers had been treated relatively well in France, and the president at the time would 
Joe Wilson feared that being treated decently overseas would embroil black soldiers, maybe made them too big for their britches, made them expect fair treatment at home, the home for which they just risked their lives. Let that sink in. The home which they bled for, killed for. This was the final gust of wind. Not really the final, but he was getting there. On Du Bois tiptoe type walk of racism. His past as critiques of anti racist spinning them into ant imaginary hate mongers, and finally come back to bite him. He spent so many years trying to convince black people to mold themselves to a version of white people. He spent then so much time trying to learn, speak, dress, and impress some away. He tried to prove white Americans with the significant fact of racial disparities, believing reason could kill racism, as if reason had birthed it. He had even spent energy ridiculing eaters like Ida B. E. Wells Barnett for passionately calling on the black people to fight. But every year, the failures for freedom piled up. Du Bois' urgence for black people to protest and fight became stronger. Du Bois, the king of assimilation, became calling out white men's twist of words. It was time for a new Negro, he preached. One that would no longer sit quietly, waiting for assimilate. And in 1919, when many of those soldiers came home from war, they came home as new Negroes. Unfortunately, new Negroes were met by old whites. Violenced. The normal racist ideas weren't working on black people, so racists had to go above and beyond. The summer of 1919 was the bloodiest summer be since Reconstruction. So much so it was named Red Summer. Drew Boyce responded to Red Summer of a collection of essays where many things about black people being people. But one of the most revolutionary things he did in the collection was honor black women. This was a huge deal, because black women had either been completely left out of the race conversation or turned to objects to look at and to take advantage of. Even though Du Bois had done this, Marcus Gavery, Jamaican who t had taken issue on the NACP, still despised him. Like I said, Gavery was a st was a staunch anti-racist. Though Du Bois was making anti-racist strides, he was still stranding the Emilius line, and Gavery thought he was condescend condescending to his own race. That he moved and act like he was a better black person. A special black person. An exception. And of course there was the biggest beef of all. The conflict around the premise that light-skinned people were being given advantages and treated better. Coloranism. Gavery wasn't completely wrong. Though Du Bois wanted black people to be a people with the freedom to be different when it came to art and music. He differently looked at himself as the standard. So, if you weren't him, light-skinned, hybrid, get it, you weren't quite good enough. He also reinforced Harriet Beecher Stowe's idea that black people had more soul than whites, which meant they had less mind, and therefore better at creative things. Givery would have argued against that, but he didn't get the chance to, because the U.S. government charged him with mail fraud, and he has been and he was deported three years later. With no one there to challenge him, Du Bois' old crutch that he couldn't just seen a divorce himself from. Upless succession was about to transform into a different kind of Be My Friend bait. And this, that was chapter 18. This is chapter 19. 18. No, that. Chapter 18 we just did in chapter 19 the one. Can't sing and dance and write it away. Du Bois had now become the older guy hanging around all the young artists in Harlem. On March 21st, 1924, he'd gone to a club to see a bunch of young poets and novelists who were supporters of his. This event is where he met many of the young black artists who would form what is known as the Harlem Renaissance, and Du Bois wanted to make sure they used their art to advantage black people by getting white people to respect them. It was a new form of uplift succession, media succession, which basically just means using media, in this case art, to woo whites. But not everyone was kissing Du 
Boy's assimilatious feat. There was a group, there was a resistant group of artists that were emerged in 1926 who called themselves the... I'm not gonna name it. The book I'm reading is stamped. Um, you should go and, like, read that book yourself. They believed they should be able to make whatever they wanted to express themselves as a... As whole humans without worrying about white acceptance. One of this group's most prominent poets were Langston Hughes, who declared that if a black artist leaned towards whiteness, his art wouldn't be truly his own. That it was okay to be a black artist without having to feel insecure or shame. They wanted to function the same way as the blues woman, like Mae Rainey and Bestie Smith, who sang about pain and smacks or whatever they w wanted to. Even if the images of blackness weren't always positive, Webb Du Bois and the supporters of Uplift Succession and Media Succession had a hard time accepting any gives of black people being less than different, less than dignified. But the, but the group against Du Bois wasn't arguing that. If black people couldn't be shown as imperfect, they couldn't be shown as human, and that was racist. It would be up to black artists to show themselves. Let's show them. Show themselves. No, oh, no, just end like that there. To read and paint and dance and sculpt their humanity. Whether white pers without white people liked it or not. Whether white people saw them as human or not. And they didn't see them as human. Instead, black people were symbols, animals, and ideas to be feared. As a matter of fact, in 1929, Three years after the formation of this this opposite group, Claude G. E. Bowers, there's no S, an editor of the New York Post, confirmed this in a book he wrote called The Tragic Era, The Revolution After Lincoln. Wait, 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 wait. Lincoln. 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 Abraham Lincoln had been dead for more than 60 years. But reconstruction, if sprung correctly, could be used as a way to play upon the hatred of racist white people. This was a way Bowers could trap, no, tap into the old days. Trim up that old hateful feeling. Rev the engine of racism. Which, by the way, was still as alive in consent, which is... Which is why anti-racist artists, like the group I'm not going to even say, found it silly to play into white comfort. Bowers was angry about the fact that Herbert Hoover, a, Re a Republican, swept the election in 1928. Remember, this is what you wrote. Snatching several southern states. The tragic era was meant to remind Democrats, Southerners, and racists that innocent white people were tortured by black Republicans during Reconstruction. It's almost laughable. Almost. But it charged up racists and even and sparked a re-release of the racist classic birth of a nation. The argument of the savage, inferior black people, black person, rise again. It gets exhausting, doesn't it? And this time, Du Bois, who'd been slowly itching towards anti-racism, decided to respond to the Bowers book. Du Bois wrote and published what he thought was his best work, Black Reconstruction and America, 1860-1880. to And in it, he debunked all of Bowers' arguments and described how, if anything, Reconstruction was stifled by white race elites who created more white privileges for poor whites as long as they stood shoulder to shoulder on the necks of white people. Whiteness first. All this book is just always whiteness first. It was 1933. Du Bois' life as an assimilist had finally started to vaporize. He just wanted black people to be self-sufficient, to be black, and for that to be enough. Here he argued the American educational system was failing the country because it didn't tell the truth about race in America. Because it was too concerned with protecting and defending the white race. Ultimately, he was arguing what 
he'd been arguing in various different ways. In what Frederick Douglass, Soldier Near True, Booker T. Washington, Ida B. Barnett, Marcus Greeley, and many others before him had argued and as am, that black people were human despite uplift succession, despite media succession, despite the fact that the NAACP was under new leadership, Walter White, who had decided to learn mo who decided to lean more into uplift succession. White wanted to transform the NAACP into an organization of refined folks like himself, whose mission was to go before courts and politicians to pursue the white judges and legislators to end racial discrimination. But in 1933, Drew Boys wanted nothing to do with this, m with this mess then. He had finally turned away from assimilation. He had finally turned away Turned, he turned away from assimilation, and he had to turned towards anti-racism. So he took off from the NAACP, escaping them, this and and through through a cursey, and headed down to Atlanta University to teach. He taken up a new school of thought, inspired by Bill Marx. Du broke Du Bois broke ground on a new idea: anti-racist socialism. He used this idea to move forward into anti-racism, even critiquing black colleges for having white-centered cur curriculums, or for having white people teaching Negro studies, because the country had just entered into the Great Depression. Nobody had money, because it's one thing to have no money. It's another thing to have no money and no freedom. So black people were expecting a kind of Double depression. Experiencing this kind. And even though through the pre... The, and even though the sitting president, Franklin D. Roosevelt, a Democrat, had developed an initiative called a New Deal, a flurry of government relief problems and job programs to keep people afloat, black people need their own New Deal to keep them safe from the old deal, which was the racist deal, which was no deal at all. This actually starts the shift in which democratic and and this actually starts a democratic shift, and we get the recent democratic parties and republican parties that we get today. It's not that the New Deal was didn't help black people at all; it did, but just not enough. And while poor white people were trying to build their own systems and as elite. Black people were uncomfortable in pushing back against Du Bois. He published an article that would rock everyone. It was 1934. This piece was called Segregation. Du Bois sided with his former rival, Marcus Garvely, stating that there is a place, maybe even importance, to a voluntarily non discriminatory separation. Basically, Du Bois was arguing for black safe spaces, spaces that will resist and fight against the media storm of racist ideas that came year after year. From the stereotype that black people were sexually immoral or hypersexual, or that black households were absent of fathers and that this family dynamic made them inferior, or that skin tone and hair texture were connected to beauty and, it and intelligence, Du Bois about my phone. Oh, no was at a low percent, so I couldn't been able to finish the last few words of the chapter because uh, it went on a little battery. So where did I last start at again? Alright. Du Bois, about the support of his partners at the NAACP, the assumptionists who were once in line with him, wanted to combat it, combat it all. End of chapter 19.